Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's try that with a little <laughs> more cheer and exuberance. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. indeed. Wonderful. Welcome on this bright and beautiful morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Welcome to St. Luke's United Church in Cambridge, Ontario. Welcome to all our friends joining us on Facebook and YouTube, and to all of you here in the sanctuary. And a welcome to our guests this morning. Thank you for joining us, and for those traveling for Easter, we wish you a safe journey and much enjoyment with family and friends. A happy and blessed Easter to you all. A few announcements. The food bank. The food bank. Our cart is at the back, so if you are able, please bring a perishable good of any type, it's always appreciated, or if you feel more comfortable making a monetary donation, that works just as well. M&S Easter envelopes are at the back of the church if you would like to make a special donation. And today is Communion Sunday, so there will be a helping hand offering as well. I'd just like to take a moment to thank all those involved in the Good Friday service. It was so nice to have Cedar Hill and Wesley joining us after a three-year hiatus. The joint choir was amazing, very powerful. And if you were not able to attend, you can catch it on Facebook or YouTube. The beauty of technology and thanks to Andrew. Thank you to the music directors and all those involved in the preparation of the service and the readers, those preparing and tidying up the refreshments that were enjoyed at a time of fellowship after the service. Thank you, thank you to all. Church Council is, coming, is this coming Tuesday evening at 7.30. If you do not have the link, please see Rosemary. And please, all pod and committee leaders have their reports in to Rosemary. We welcome back Reverend Lynn Bandy. So nice to see you, and we're grateful to have you here today leading us in worship and presiding over communion. Good morning and welcome. Thank you, Joni. It's my pleasure to be back with you today. I, I was talking to the choir and uh, trying to remember how many times I've been here. This is just my third time, but it feels like I've been here longer than that. You've made me very welcome, so thank you. And the, always the invitation to celebrate Easter with the congregation and to share the sacrament of the Holy Communion is a particularly precious one. It's lovely to be with you today, and I can't think of any better way to express our joy at the good news of Easter than to sing about it. So thanks to Marion and Daria and the choir, who will lead us beautifully, and thanks to Heloni and Joni and Andrew and all the hands that have had a part in preparing and planning and sharing this celebration today. I invite your participation as well for those uh, parts of the service where we pray together and sing together and in responsive readings together. But don't worry, relax, I'll tell you when you have to do it. Today we meet and worship on the ancestral land, the Haldeman tract of the Adirondack, the Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. In August of 2012, 11 years ago, at the 41st General Council, the United Church of Canada acknowledged the presence and spirituality of Aboriginal peoples in the United Church by revising the church's crest. The crest changes included incorporating the colors often associated with the Aboriginal medicine wheel, which teaches us to seek balance in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the circle of life. The crest changes also included the addition of a phrase, 
which means all my relations. To that end, we continue to work being, to work, working together towards right relations with the First Nation peoples and Métis and Inuit in our country. We thank them for their steadfast presence. Now we light the Christ candle. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Thanks be to God. Easter, the day we can say that we believe that the day is coming when God's grace will change the human heart and we will live as one with every living thing. We believe that the day is coming when Christ's compassion will fill the earth and no one will do harm, be hurt, or feel alone. We believe that the day is coming when the Spirit's freedom will unbind our souls and we will live generous lives for each other with a joy no circumstance can alter. We believe this day is coming and we wait and work for it with steadfast hope. For God has promised it and God is faithful. We believe that this is that day. Please join with me in the call to worship that you find, oh no, it's the introit now, isn't it? It's the introit. Hold, the, hold your horses on the call to worship. We'll, we will come back. The choir sings the introit for us.
You know, I looked over this order of service about four times <laughs> and missed the introit each time. <laughs> Goodness. Let's give Andrew a minute to get back upstairs for the call to worship. Oh, Darius got it. Thank you. Please join with me in the call to worship. I'll be the light print, you be the bold print. We believe in the God of life whose breath is in us and whose mercy encircles the creation. We believe in Jesus Christ, who loved us and did us and shared our pain. He is with us in power. He is with us on the promise. Even to the end of the age. We believe in the Holy Spirit who welcomes us into the household of faith, gives us gifts in abundance, enlivens our hearts with joy and urges us into the world to testify without fear to God's justice and grace. Glory, thanks, and praise be yours, holy God, now and forever. Let us pray together the prayer you see on the screen. O God of Easter and surprising life, we do not understand, and so we run away from the empty tomb there are no sounds to prepare us, no noise to announce a miracle. You come to us in silence and you do not explain. Risen with the sun, you light our darkness, warm our cold, turn our defeats into victories, and at last we know that only in silence is the word. We rise in you eternally. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. Now, I know you've been eager to sing this morning, so it's your turn. We'll all join together in singing from Voices United, the Red Hymn Book, number 157, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And you can remain seated or you can stand, whatever you would like. The words are overhead.
please be seated. With so much to celebrate today, you might say to yourself, why do we have to stop and confess things? Didn't Jesus make everything right for us? Well, yes, but let's go deeper. Here's the point of confession. To root out the weeds we didn't even know were there and to loosen us from the fear of, resur of where resurrection will take us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess that we think of Easter as the springtime holiday rather than the mystery holiday, the hope time holiday, the now it's up to us holiday. We're more at home with bulbs and bunnies than mortality and resurrection. We confess that we're afraid to talk about death and we avoid those who are dying or leave their tender care to others. We confess that sometimes we engage in personal and community behaviors that are life-denying. Sometimes we let things die. Hopes and dreams, relationships, communities of faith, because we aren't willing to claim your tomb-opening power. We see it today and pray that you would accept our repentance and more be risen in each of our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the assurance of pardon. Beloved ones, the power of resurrection is at work in us and with us through the former things of our lives and in the new heaven and earth that God is yet creating. The Spirit of Christ leads us onto paths of victory over, over sorrow and death, disbelief and fear. Receive God's grace in the secret place of your heart where there are no words. For the forgiveness of God is too marvelous for words. And as we turn to the scripture, before we hear the sacred words from the Gospel of John, I want to read a poem entitled, Everyone Sang. Everyone suddenly burst out singing and I was filled with such delight as prisoned birds must find in freedom, winging wildly across the white orchards and dark green fields, on and on and out of sight. Everyone's voice was suddenly lifted and beauty came like the setting sun. My heart was shaken with tears and horror drifted away. Oh, but everyone was a bird and the song was wordless. The singing will never be done. You know, each of the gospel writers has a slightly different version of what happened on Easter morning. The gospel of John's always been my favorite. So I turn this morning to that passage and I'm reading chapter 20, verses one through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the Lord bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word, and to God's name be the praise and the glory, now and forever. Amen. I think it's time for us to sing a hymn. Yes, it is. <laughs> hymn number 182. You know what? Why don't you stay seated for this one if you'd like to? It's kind of a meditative him to prepare us for the sermon. Stay with us through the night. The words will be overhead if you need the music. Voices United 182. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving God, enable us to meet this day to meet the risen Christ in the deep places of our lives. As we meet him there, take away our fear and replace it with faith. 
Complete the gospel story in our lives by the faithful way we live and die. And in the presence of our risen and living Lord, help us joyfully to sing the resurrection song. In his name we pray. Amen. I know a woman who woke up in the middle of the night from a deep sleep with the certainty that she needed to be somewhere else. That somewhere else was at her father's hospital bed. So she got up out of bed, and while she dressed, she nuked some coffee for the first leg of the journey. Her father lived 200 miles away. She grabbed her car keys, kissed her sleeping husband, and took to the road. For 200 miles in the middle of the night, she listened to the tires sing on the pavement, watched the sporadic flow of traffic, tuned into all-night radio, talk radio stations, to stay alert, and realized that, an, that the night had a kind of steel beauty, all futuristic girders and light standards and ribbons of highway, though mostly she thought about her father and this odd, impulsive dream which disrupted her sleep. Actually, she thought almost exclusively of him, so that when she finally found herself by his bed in the palliative care unit in the hospital, 200 miles from home, it was almost a surprise. How did I get here? She wondered. The nurses said he was fine, stable, comfortable, but she found him wakeful in the middle of the night, restless, though he calmed when he saw her. So because it was such an odd night already, and because everybody loves it, she sang to him, all alone in that darkened room with the dawn just beginning to color the horizon. She sang to him with tears streaming down her face. Can you guess what she sang? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And then he died. I know a woman, another woman. In fact, I buried her not so long ago. She was a lovely woman who stood tall and proud as she married her sweetheart. And when her four sons were born, there was no prouder mother to be found. But then her husband began to come home late for dinner, and then he missed dinner altogether. And then he couldn't start the day without a drink from a bottle that he hid in the shed. And then the next thing she knew, her sweetheart had become a stranger, more committed to his drinking buddies than to his young family. And that tall, proud woman didn't know what to do. And she was bent low from shame and sorrow. Until finally, someone told her about a group that met in a church basement. It was called Al-Anon. It wasn't a church group as such. But for the next 40 years, she attended weekly meetings of Al-Anon. And that organization became to her as dear as her own family. Because of Al-Anon, she changed, and therefore the family changed, and it changed even more when AA became part of her husband's life. So that at her funeral, she had me pray with the mourners this prayer, which is prayed at every meeting of this fellowship, so far as I know. Do you know it? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
she would have agreed with another woman who said, I don't know much about the church and about miracles, like that miracle of Christ turning water into wine, but I do know about the miracle in our home, which turned wine into furniture and food. I know another woman who was going about her business in her middle age, thinking about picking up a little part-time job. Her teenage sons were at an age where they were a little more independent, grade 11, grade 12, growing up. So she began to search the paper and to talk to friends. She and her husband began to think about a cottage up north, maybe a retirement kind of thing for the future. Not for now, exactly. And then. One day, in the very midst of all the ordinariness that we all know, she felt an excruciating abdominal pain, unlike anything she had known. Out of the blue, she was so scared that when it passed, she called her husband at work, and he came home immediately and found her barely able to stand up for the pain. Now he was scared, too. So he called the ambulance, and it came roaring across town fast, the husband thought, thank goodness the boys are in school. What am I going to tell them about their mother? For he was very worried. He followed the ambulance to the hospital, driving only a little over the speed limit. But when he got there to the hospital, he couldn't find her. How can you lose track of somebody who arrives in an ambulance, he yelled. Where is my wife? Because the truth was, no one could find her until someone remembered that there'd been an emergency arrival in the maternity ward. So that's where the husband found his wife. And very soon, they were both surprised to meet their baby daughter. And though at first, both husband and wife were afraid and thought one of them might be singing the funeral hymn, Abide With Me, Fast Falls the Eventide, in fact, they found themselves humming something else entirely. It was this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I know another woman. I know a lot of women. <laughs> a surgeon who was sent to the Congo serving with Doctors Without Borders, MSF. Several times a year for three weeks or six weeks at a time as needed, she packed up her suitcase with chocolates and baguettes for the various hospital staff she would meet, and sometimes with clothes or books for return visits to regions she knew. She developed quite a taste for corn-based food and many, too many, interesting stories about bugs. I think of her often as I stand at a communion table, and I think of all the folks who care about her and who stood ringed around her in prayer while she found herself in some very dangerous place in the world. Once through the miracle of email, my surgeon friend wrote this to all of us who followed her. Feeling depressed, just got back from the hospital where I did a laparotomy on a five-year-old boy who had a cardiac arrest and died just after we finished the dressing. We did cardiac massage for 15 minutes or so with no results. It really is no consolation to know I couldn't do anything else since he is still dead. I'm sure that there is some message about how precious life is when you see it pass away so suddenly, but I don't know that I'm feeling it right now. Tomorrow will be another day, and I hope a better one. If I could, I would have given her the song we sang a few minutes ago. Remember, stay with us through the night. Stay with us through the night. Stay with us through the pain till the morning breaks again. 
I read about a woman who went to a tomb, to the tomb, to a grave in the dark. She came slowly with dragging feet. She came to that place for the same reason that we all go to old sorrow or new suffering. She came because she couldn't stay away, because even when her body sat at table in her home, her heart was standing in the place where love rested. That's why she went to the garden tomb. What takes you to your tomb? She is amazed to discover that the stone has been rolled away and that the tomb is empty. So now she believes that to the wrongful murder of her Messiah, the Romans have added grave robbery. She runs to get help and tell his friends, and after looking into the empty tomb, one disciple believes, whatever that means, though afterwards both disciples simply go, well, home. Elsewhere we learn that the report from the women disciples is labeled an idle tale, hinting that women are so suggestible so easily lost, they probably went to the wrong tomb, so clueless as to be easily dismissed. But at least we would have asked for directions, right, women? <laughs> also, if you ever want to learn a language, learn Greek so you can see the word that they use, the disciples use to actually describe what she said. It's a good deal earthier than, than the idle tale I'm giving you this morning. So while the disciples simply go home, this woman, her name was Mary, stayed weeping, for by now she's completely beside herself. Grieving the death of her friend, convinced that grave robbers are at work, faced with the empty tomb, and dismissed by the disciples, well, it's too much. She's a wreck. It's a good thing, though, that she stays, for she has a vision of angels. And angels, you know, are only ever arrows from God. And then she sees someone she vaguely recognizes. She thinks it's the gardener, but it's only when he speaks her name, saying, Mary, that she sees him and recognizes him. And she reaches for him, causing him to say, don't try to hold on to me. Once again, she runs not with news of an empty tomb, but with this news, I have seen the Lord. Now I know another woman who comes every Easter morning and sees the empty tomb. She looks in and sees the folded grave clothes and has the sense of something just beyond her seeing, just at the edge of vision, a glimpse, nothing more. The tomb is surely empty. She's heard all the theories, resuscitation, drugging with sacred mushrooms. It was the 60s when we came up with that one. Soldiers on the take, soldiers who weren't doing their job properly, disciples who steal the body, you've heard these too. She heard all the theories and all the attempts to explain away what happened at that tomb, to make it normal or natural. What happened there is not normal, not natural. But she believes this, that whatever happened inside the tomb, outside the tomb, each time Jesus meets his friends and calls their names or lets them put their fingers in his wounds, and shares a barbecue that each time the disciples become, as Barbara Brown Taylor says, stronger, wiser, kinder, more daring. She knows that every time Jesus comes to them, they become more like him. She knows the glory and brokenness of human nature, that it will sing amazing grace at a deathbed as a statement of faith after being called in a dream. Human nature will take life's experiences and fashion 
a beautiful gift or creed. Human nature will be surprised by joy and crippled and overwhelmed by death. It's who we are. She knows that only God can make death die. She longs to be stronger, wiser, kinder, more daring, and more like Jesus. I am that woman. Let us pray. Loving God, in the presence of our risen, living Lord, help us joyfully to sing the resurrection song. In his name we pray. Amen. And now I believe the anthem will be sung.
The offering will now be received. Let us pray. God of great gifts, this morning we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you thanks. With the resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to your song of peace. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your kingdom come. Amen. We prepare now to receive communion. This is how it's going to happen, in case it's been a while since you've been in a United Church, if ever. All I want to begin by saying is that all are welcome at this table. Whether you're a member of this church or any church, all you need is a desire to follow the risen Christ. Not perfection. You don't need to be perfect. Clearly, I demonstrate that a lot of the time. But a small amount of faith, just a little bit of faith, you can cup in your hand and bring. That's all you need and you are welcome to share in this sacred moment. After the communion great prayer of thanksgiving, I will break the bread and I will elevate the cup and I will invite you to share by coming forward so that Joni and I may serve you. This is the first time in, since for a little while since we've been able to serve you in person. So I'll serve the bread, Joni will serve the juice. The service, and if, if it's inconvenient or difficult for you to come forward, we can come to you, so don't worry. Let's get ready by singing together the first two verses of our communion hymn, which is number 468 in Voices United, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. We're going to sing the first two verses now. find the words overhead for the responses. The words overhead? Okay, now you've got me. <laughs> yes. I'll be one, you be all. God is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to God. Let us give God thanks and praise. We do give God thanks and praise. We give you thanks, God of compassion, for breathing life into being at the beginning of creation. 
We give you thanks for breathing hope into our ancestors' dry bones. We give you thanks for breathing with us through our brother Jesus. We give you thanks for breath beyond death, the unbounded mercy of resurrection. We give you thanks for the wind of the spirit that breathes in our own lungs and breathes in us as your one body. May we, through this gift of holy breath, join the spirit's persistent, insistent, consistent pant for true life. And so we say, Hallelujah. And so we cry. Hallelujah. And so we shout. Hallelujah. For all that keeps life going, water, light, air, food, love, friendship, and care, we thank you, God. In the stories of the people of Israel, in the stories of people around the world, and in our own stories, we have heard of your overwhelming love for all for all that grows and flows and flies, and for human beings of every shape and size and color, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Your love for us is incomprehensible, God. Even when we do damage to ourselves, to other people, to the rest of your creation, you call us back to your love. Through wise women and men, through teachers and preachers and prophets, through singers and dancers and storytellers, but primarily through Jesus, the Christ, you call us back to your love. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. With all of your creation, we sing praise. We remember and ask for forgiveness. We remember and ask for your wisdom. As we come to your table, God, we remember those who have sinned against us, and we release them. As we come to your table, God, we remember those whom we have sinned against, and we ask your forgiveness. As we come to your table, God, we remember the night that Jesus sat with friends and disciples. They gathered together for a meal of celebration and hope and memory. As they were eating, Jesus looked at these folks who had walked with him. He picked up the bread, gave thanks to you, God most holy, and he broke it and looked at them. With all their eyes on him listening intently, they heard him say, this is my body given for you. Eat this and remember me. He took a cup filled with wine. He gave thanks to you, God most holy, and held that cup close. He looked at his friends and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink it, remember me. And so we eat, we drink, and we remember. Holy God of all, we ask your blessing on this bread and this cup. We ask your blessing on all gathered here. We ask your blessing on all creation. In this moment, may your Holy Spirit make us one with Christ and one with all. Hear us now as we sing together the prayer Jesus taught us.
took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat it, remember me. And similarly, he took the cup of Passover wine and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, remember me.
please join with me for the pr in the prayer after communion. There we go. For the bread we have eaten, for the wine we have tasted, for the spirit in which we live, we thank you, God of all love. May this burst of flavor be on our lips and in our hearts and rooted in our souls so we can share your love with your world. Alleluia. Amen. Just stay seated while we sing the last verse of hymn number 468, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Let us pray. God of the bright and morning star, God of the rising sun, God of darkness banished, we praise and worship you. For empty tombs, thank you. For disciples running with good news, thank you. For your presence alive, powerful, resurrected, thank you. For your victory over death and over all the powers that would defeat us, thank you. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors proclaiming good news. Good news in our kitchens and living rooms, good news in the offices and workplaces, good news in the fields and factories. Help us to be that good news, walking softly on this good earth, caring gently for all people, living hopefully into your kingdom. Today we think of all who are grieving and we name those in our heart. And we pray for the sick and dying. And we pray for those who are ill. And we pray for places in the world that are torn by war and bloodshed. And goodness, there are so many. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch sight of your kingdom come in the person of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns in us forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today Number 173 in Voices United, the Red Hymn Book, Thine is the Glory. You'll see the words overhead.
When it takes hold, resurrection doesn't let us go. It shakes the dead awake. It shakes the darkness from the light. It shakes the silence from our throats. And it wrestles death from all that is dying. Let us go out into the world and in the upheaval of re resurrection, seek out the life God offers. Leave the graveyard. Leave the past and go. And now may the God of Sarah as of Abraham and the God of Jesus nurtured in the water of the womb and the God of the Holy Spirit who broods over us as a mother with her children be with us all. Amen. Let's sing a responsive verse of a hymn. Mm -hmm. 